Well, you're all into fundraising, right? And uh, we have a new fundraising scheme. It's called IEB, the Inland Empire Band. They're going to be touring, and tickets are not that expensive. $12.95. That was outstanding. And uh, once again, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Sharon and I, uh, for the first time in seven years, had the opportunity to go visit family. Uh, we went to Little Rock, Arkansas, down in the deep south. And I have discovered the second language I'm going to be taking for the ICCM master's degree. It's called South. Because down there, they speak just a little slower, and they say, y'all. So today, if you hear me say, y'all, it's just a new language. But we had a, we had a great time visiting, uh, visiting family. I hope, again, everybody had a wonderful, wonderful holiday weekend. And you know, let's just get down to business. Let's open up the Word of God. Let's go to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 13. Let's start there this evening and go with me here. The title of our lesson is Make Every Effort. Luke 13, verse 22. The Bible says, Then Jesus went through the towns and the villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and they will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, he'll stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, We ate and we drank with you, and you taught us in your streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. Happy Thanksgiving. We have an amazing passage right here. And I think that as we dig into this passage tonight, I just want to say that this, this is something that I want us to take a step back before we can take a step forward. This is in the journey section of Jesus' ministry. And, and I, I want us to get started here because my first point tonight, these are simple points, there's four of them, is the setting. And let's get the setting. Let's understand, why did Jesus teach this? Why did he say what he said here? Let's back up to Luke chapter 9 very quickly. Let's look at the beginning of the journey section and the Samaritan opposition. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into the Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and he rebuked them, and they went to another village. So right here is really the beginning of the journey section. From Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 51, all the way up through the middle of Luke chapter 19. This journey section, the part of his mystery, the times approaching, the end of Jesus' early earthly ministry is about to come to an end. Jesus knows that he's going to Jerusalem to die on the cross. And what does the Bible say here in Luke chapter 9, verse 51? That he resolutely sets out for Jerusalem. To be resolute means that Jesus had a firm determination about him. He was bold, he was steady, he was decisive. In our today vernacular, it was do or die. Jesus was resolute. 37% of Luke's gospel takes place in the journey. You know, this is really something about spreading the gospel, taking the good news. You heard it in all the sharing. We saw about the EMC, all the people visiting Moscow, Kiev, and India, and Manila. But Jesus here, in this journey section, he gives us 17 parables. It is to paint and give us an illustration the importance and the urgency of the teaching. It's his major concern right now because he knows he's going to leave and he's got to get his disciples ready. Jesus has got to get the disciples ready to minister without him. 
The journey begins as it's going to end. It ends in failure in the Samaritan village. And we know that he's rejected in Jerusalem, but he overcomes that because he dies on the cross and he's resurrected on the third day. You know, it's amazing how the disciples choose to respond. It's an improper response to the rejection. You know, they want to judge immediately to the Samaritan village. You know, that refuses to respond to Jesus' message. And you know, just a little while before this, in the chapter before, we know that Jesus with, was with James and John and Peter and up in the mountain of the Transfiguration. We know that Elijah and Moses were there. And I'm sure an amazing impact, amazing impact on James and John. And I'm sure Jesus was talking to them. <clears throat> we know what Elijah did. All the great things that he did. And how, G how Elijah up against the 450 prophets of Baal. You know, and ultimately they just couldn't do it. And he was mocking them and he was giving them a hard time. And na 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 na, you can't start your fire. But he pours water three times on his sacrifice. He prays to God. He asks God. He asks God twice. God brings down fire from heaven to burn up the sacrifice. And he wipes out the 450 prophets of Baal. And I'm sure that's where James and John got the idea here. You know, just think, you want us to call down fire? We're going to take him out. But that's not what Jesus wanted. There's a deeper message here. And, and, and the deeper message is that, you know what, everyone gets an opportunity to respond. Everyone gets the opportunity to respond to the message. God gives people time to respond to his kingdom. And I think if we run over here to chapter Two, or excuse me, Second Peter, chapter three. We're going to see how important it is what God wants all men to understand. In Second Peter, chapter three, verse nine, Peter writes here. He says, "The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone." to come to repentance. And I just simply say, this is, for me, the three Ps. Right here, it's God's promise. It's his promise, but God is also patient because he does not want one of us, anyone, to perish. That's God's plan. He's not slow in keeping that promise, as we might understand it. You know, and I, I just think it's amazing his grace and everything else that he offers us. This was a time of grace. The time for judgment had not yet arrived. My question to you this morning or this afternoon here is, how do we respond and act towards each other in our relationships? You want to call down fire from heaven and take each other out? You know, that brother missed midweek, he's falling away. That sister, she has missed rent for three months. But do you understand the situation? And are we really understanding the work that needs to be done to help each other and to be patient and show each other the grace that God wants us to learn and understand? The disciples showed a misguided zeal. They missed the timing and the spirit that's required in order to be effective. And we want to be effective. But we also need to help people understand if they don't respond, the decisions that they're going to make now, it's going to influence how they are treated later on. But Jesus is on the move, so let's go back. Let's go back to Luke chapter 13. So you kind of have the setting, right? Second point is the question. It said right here in verse 23, someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Now, have you ever thought of the question you want to ask Jesus when you meet him? Have you really contemplated and taken the time because you're going to see him and you're going to meet him what do you want to ask him? What are you going to ask our Lord? And I think that this person asks a very important question. You got to ask yourself why. Why did he ask this question? I have three theories. A, this man was probably concerned about his own situation. He was concerned. Or B, this man maybe heard the Sermon on the Mount and he was looking for clarification. Matthew chapter 7, it said in verse 14, talked about a very different, but same message. Talked about a small gate and narrow road and said only few were going to find it. Here Jesus is giving another tough 
lesson and another tough teaching. So he's concerned, maybe he's seeking clarification, or C, he heard how challenging it was to obey Jesus. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It says, Then Jesus said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, he must take up his cross daily, and he must follow me. Whoever wants to save his life, he'll lose it. Whoever wants to lose his life for me, he'll save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. Right here, we see that Jesus says, listen, if you're going to follow me, you must deny yourself. You must pick up your cross, and you must pick your cross up daily, and you've got to follow me. Every single one of us, as a disciple, we have to make choices. We have to make decisions. We all have a cause. And I know I just even reflect on, it's been seven years. Seven years ago this week, Sharon and I made a trip to Portland, Oregon to check it out. Little did we know what we were signing up for. <laughs> and I would never, ever in my wildest dreams have imagined how the last seven years have unfolded in our lives. It has far exceeded our expectations. That there's, there's no, I, can't, I can't even begin to describe everything. Because when you really count the cost and, and you really pull the trigger, God will bless you. And, and, I, and I think about, we, we're, we, we left our family. Our family's in the Midwest. We left our job. And I had an amazing, amazing job at General Mills. I love the company. I think it's the best company in America. And, 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 but, but there's a cost. You know, we left our home. We, we put everything in our car. We moved out here. We didn't have a place to live. We'd only met the people once or twice. But it was by faith. You know, and you got to, it just... I have to remind myself, whether you're interested or not, because it builds my faith, to remind myself that when you're willing to really count that cost and you really want to follow Jesus, he will do amazing things beyond what you can imagine in your life. He can. Just let him. But just submit to him. You know, and it's just, you got to wrap yourself around this scripture because in order to save your life, you got to lose it. You know, it just, that doesn't make sense, does it? But it does because Jesus says if you give it up, it's going to be saved. You get salvation. You, you, you get eternity with the Lord. You, you get so much more. And it's so good to be with our physical families through the holidays, but it's so much better to be back together to worship as a spiritual family. It's so much more important. And Jesus, in the end, he says, don't be ashamed of me. Do not be ashamed of me. If you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you. So this, this, is, this guy, he was seeking, he was trying to understand some things. But we need to know that one day Jesus is going to render judgment. So how did Jesus respond to the question? Let's go back to Luke chapter 13. Jesus didn't say, don't worry, just believe. Accept me into your heart. Jesus didn't say, it doesn't matter what you believe, just be sincere. Jesus didn't say, all religions are the same. Hey, just be a good person. And I, and I hear a lot of that. I hear a lot of that in my family. You know, a good person. You know, you just got to believe. You just got to accept Jesus in your heart. No. No, no. That, that's not what Jesus said, did he? So we got the setting. We got the question. Let's get the answer. Point number three. Jesus says here in verse 24, he says, you have to make every effort. To enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter, and they're not going to be able to. Jesus says you've got to make every effort, and I want you to think about what does that mean? What does it mean for you? What does every effort make and mean for you? Translated from the Greek, I love this because I can understand it. It's agonisomai. Agonisomai is where we get the word agonize. It's where we get to, to agonize. It means to fight, to violently struggle, to labor, to agonize. Jesus says that is what's required to enter into the kingdom. And I want to ask you this afternoon as well, what, what do you agonize over? Are, are things in your way 
from obeying and worshiping God the way that He wants you to worship Him. You agonize about your job and relationships and school and your children and family and housing and dating and marriage and maybe I'm single and I don't know if I'm ever going to get married. You agonize you over those things? But do you agonize? Do you fight and do you struggle for your relationship with God? In the kingdom, there is a battle being fought. And we have to evangelize the world because it's what he commanded us to do. Jesus died for the kingdom. He died for this. He died for what we see tonight. Matthew 26, as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, it talked about how he was sorrowful, how he was troubled, and how he was overwhelmed because he knew what he was going to face in a matter of hours. The Luke account in chapter 22, Jesus literally asks his father for the cup to be taken from him. And then God had to send an angel from heaven to strengthen Jesus. He had to strengthen him because he was in anguish. And we know that our Dr. Luke talked about how he even sweat blood. He had to sweat blood taking place just before the crucifixion. His ministry is now really coming to an end. Everything weighs in the balance. The enormousness of what's about to take place. You know what? I guarantee some of us even struggle to get here this afternoon. And we need to repent of that. We need to want to be here. This is what it is about. And we need to share it with others. You know that that Jesus, Jesus had each one of us. Can you imagine that? That Jesus had each one of us in mind going to the cross. We think there's about 106 billion people that live through all of time. You know, there's 7.2 billion people right now, roughly six and a half, seven percent of people that have ever lived, live right now. And Jesus, in his mind, was thinking of each one of us. Thinking of each one of us going to the cross. So, what does someone look like that agonizes spiritually? Let's look at a couple of examples. Let's go over to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. It says in verse 9, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Somebody that agonizes spiritually, they read the word daily. They read the word daily. Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians chapter 4, it says in verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, he sends his greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. What does somebody look like that's agonizing in their walk and their spiritual relationship with God? They are wrestling in prayer. They wrestle in prayer. Another example, Matthew chapter 20. Thanks, Earl. Matthew in chapter 20, verse 26, Jesus says here, he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, to serve and to sacrifice. And I, I think of an example here, I, do, I, I think of my wife, Sharon. I, I really, just her example to do so many things to serve other people. And, and in my flesh, at times, I gotta be honest with you, I just absolutely struggle with what she challenges us to do and the people to serve and where the needs are at. 
whether it's somebody in the hospital or somebody's not doing well, if we need to have somebody over, whatever it is, she's going to do whatever it takes to help someone. You know, and I, and I see what, what, what she's done. She's instilled that into others. And I think of our sister Elizabeth McKnight. And, and, and Elizabeth has done such a great job. Elizabeth, her story is amazing. Her daughter became a disciple. Uh, then Elizabeth became a disciple. And, and Elizabeth is a little bit older than most of the disciples. And she gave up everything out of Bakersfield, California, and retired, moved down here to be part of the kingdom. And she has taken in... Elizabeth is... Uh, She's, she's taken in sisters that have struggled. You know, she, she sets the, the, the menu for a Bible talk. She does the good news for a Bible talk. She's constantly serving people, giving people rides. And this woman has really been blessed because she wants to do what Jesus says here. This, this is what it looks like. Another example in Hebrews chapter 10. And this is why you get a 4 o'clock service. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, it says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. Somebody that's agonizing, somebody that's laboring and struggling and fighting for the relationship with God, you don't miss the meetings of the body. It supersedes everything else. That's, it's got to be our commitment, our devotion, what moves us to want to be together. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Paul writes here, though I'm free and I belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like the one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I become like one having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become weak. To win the weak, I become all things to all men, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. You've got to preach. You've got to make disciples. I think a great example here, I'm using the West Region because that's where our home is. I, 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 think, I think of our brother Paul Kelly and his wife, Caitlin. I, I, th th this couple... That they, they've done, so, yeah, everybody knows Paul's story. His dad was converted four years ago, and then Paul, and it's just a domino effect. The whole Kelly family has literally come to Christ. But, but Paul has stayed faithful here. Paul, Paul's been blessed in so many ways. He's got a wife. He's got a daughter. Uh, Paul has a, a very demanding secular job, but yet they've taken on to lead the singles ministry in the West. They not only lead a singles ministry in the West, but they oversee a house church in the West. You know, they, they've been very fruitful. Their Bible talk has been the most fruitful Bible talk we've had in the West region with all the work that they do because he wants to be whatever he needs to be to save as many as possible. Paul's an awesome example. So, gosh, isn't there an easier way? That's hard. That's hard, isn't it? Well, let's go back to Luke 13. Luke 13, he says right here, in the middle of it, he says, you know, uh, you're going to try to enter, but you're not, you're not going to be able to. He says many are going to try. Translated from the Greek here, it's zeteo. It means to desire, to seek after. I, I bet you it's true. I believe it's absolutely true. Many people desire to go to heaven. I think many people are seeking after some form of religion and seeking after God. People desire it, right, naturally. Don't you desire to go to heaven? Of course. But what does somebody or someone look like that's, that's trying? What do they look like? Probably a good person. They're going to church, probably maybe involved in a Bible talk, a midweek, reading their Bible, praying. Sounds like maybe even some disciples, right? Comfortable, but you're still doing it your way, not God's way. You know, you desire, you're trying, but you're not the spiritual essence. You're not laying it out there the way that Jesus expects us to lay it out there. And I want to ask you now, would Jesus describe you as agonizing or are you just trying? Are you agonizing or are you trying? Jesus exhorts us to labor hard to enter through that narrow door. Jesus stresses that not only is the door narrow so that people come in the right way, but also that it's the... It's only open for a short time. There's only one way into the kingdom. 
And you only have so much time to get in the kingdom. Many will seek entry and will not be able to. Many will discover the truth after the door is closed. It's going to be too late to share the blessing. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. It says here in verse 14, the consistency of our word, it says, make every effort. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one's going to see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up and causes trouble and defiles many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, for a, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. The Bible basically says right here, listen, there's going to be a time nothing's going to be able to be done. Door closes, it's done. You can cry all you want. You can plead, you can beg, you can do everything, but you had your chance. Esau sold his inheritance for a bowl of porridge. When he woke up and realized, my goodness, what have I done? It was too late. It was too late. So Jesus, he gives the answer, doesn't he? Well, let's go to our fourth and final point, the conclusion. Let's go back to Luke. Pick it back up in verse 25. It said, once, Luke chapter 13, verse 25, once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you're going to stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you're going to say, we ate with you, we drank with you, you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there. There's going to be gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, that you yourselves will be thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south, and they're going to take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last will be first, and the first will be last. The warning here is graphic. It's straightforward. You know, without a response now or without a response very soon, there will be no access. You must listen now to have a seat at the table. Happy Thanksgiving. Jesus says, yeah, you had the opportunity to get to know me. You chose not to. The Lord says, I, I don't know you. He says it twice. I don't know you. They become perplexed. <laughs> you were with us. We were hanging out with you. We ate with you. We drank with you. You taught in our streets. Jesus makes it clear it's more than just being in his presence and listening to the word. It's so much more than that. Exposure to him, it's not enough. Outward contact, it's not enough. There's no bargaining. The issue's simple. Did you know me? Did you really know me? It says some are going to be thrown out. But since it is Thanksgiving, let's take a negative and turn it into a positive. In verse 29, isn't this awesome? People are going to gather from east and west and north and south. You know, there's going to be a gathering of every nation you know, every race, every language, every people, we're going to gather together for this great feast. That's what Jesus says here. And I just think again about the thanksgiving that we experienced with family and all the food and everything else, that you want to make sure you have a place to go, that you have a seat at the feast. And I love it in, in conclusion. I says, finally, you know, there's just this reversal a first and last. You know, not, it's not what we expect. It's not what we expect. Jesus makes several things very, very clear. 
He says that the entrance into the kingdom requires careful attention. You know, everybody's on the same footing. There's only one passport into the kingdom, that's repentance, and that's baptism the way Jesus, Jesus and God explain it. The door to enter is small. There's only one way to enter. You enter on God's terms. The time is short, and the door is still open. Jesus takes that question. Are only a few going to be saved? And Jesus, in his infamous way, turns it around, and he says, are you going to be among those that are saved. Amen? All right. Let's take a very brief fellowship break. We'll be right back with a song, and then we're going to give you the financial presentation. Amen?